Welcome back. Good evening, Budapest. Good morning, Los Angeles, and everyone in between. <laughs> We're back here with Gabor Harsani, uh, better known as the Hungarian Master of Silence, and with Robert Robin. And uh, Robert what, what am I better known as? You're better known as <laughs> the author of Sound Bites from Silence. <laughs> oh, okay. Which, by the way. Oh! <laughs> I thought maybe, just maybe, we'll start the conversation today about from a, a portion of your book. How would you like that? Okay. That would thrill me no end. Uh, Robert wrote this book, Bite Sounds, Bite, si so, bite so, Sounds from Silence. <laughs> That's what happens when you're in silence. You can't sound, sound Bites from Silence. Sound silent. Bites. <laughs> sound <laughs> Bites from Silence. Boy, my oh, going tonight. I can't wait to hire you for my publicist. <laughs> <laughs> and now here's, I'd like to talk about the book Robert didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in this session, we're going to take a small portion from the book and um, talk about it. It's, it's a book that uh, both Gabor and I read uh, almost immediately after we met Robert and we fell in love with the book. It's just amazing. Uh, we kept looking at it and saying, Oh my God, this book is written by silence and in a state of presence and, and it very much impressed us. So we, we like to talk about it quite a bit. So here goes. Silence doesn't look a certain way. In fact, it can't, ever even be seen only its effects can be seen felt and known have you ever seen the wind no of course not we know the wind because leaves run around in circles or flags strain at their tethers or your hat flies from your head Let the sound bites come forth. Mm. It's, uh, by the way, the, uh, uh, when I first uh, uh, read your book, <clears throat> and I didn't say that to Nurit, but my first impression was uh, this is as good of a quality of a book as uh, Silent Speaks, or even more so from Eckhart Tolle. Wow. It was my first thought. Yeah. Uh, it's that I good. That, yeah. yeah, it's that good. <clears throat> I mean, by good, I mean deeply expressing the unexpressible. So, Thank you. Yeah, we were amazed at some of the some of the expressions and some of the statements that um, you were able, you whoever who is <laughs> the silence who wrote it uh, was able to put together uh, in expressing what you said the unexpressible. Expressible. Well, I couldn't comment m more on that or really any part because I think each soundbite is, is a standalone expression. It doesn't need explication. However, for the sake of our conversation, I can't say what I was thinking when I wrote that because I wasn't thinking when I wrote that. Mm -hmm. For me, actually, the book had fallen into history. In other words, I wrote it in maybe 2002. Nothing much came of it in terms of getting out into the public. And then Nareet, when you and I reconnected a few months ago, your excitement for the book rekindled mine. So in a way, I'm, I'm getting to learn about that book all over again, not even as the author, but as someone who can read it and go, hmm, interesting. <laughs> the silence, the silence doesn't look a certain way. When we start our spiritual seeking, inevitably we're going to have teachers, whether they're live teachers or the authors of books or historical figures like Rumi, who's 
poems we might want to invoke. And there's a subtle phenomenon occurs at that point, which is maybe without noticing it or inquiring into it, we begin to absorb what it looks like. In other words, how do we perceive Rumi, our current teachers, Eckhart Tolle, who wrote a book, several books. Nuri, you and I spent a number of years in an ashram. We had a teacher, and I think it's fair to say that a, lo a lot of us tried to imitate, in some ways, what we perceived our teacher to be like. So we were you know, running around kind of impersonating what we thought it looked like. Mm -hmm. to be in a certain state and along the way we pick up on our various spiritual paths according to their doctrines and dogma so we often pick up certain taboos about what you can and can't do what is and isn't permitted as you become more and more realized or enter silence a lot of my life in the last couple of decades, and certainly since writing that book, has been to discover and dissolve as many of those ideas about what it looks like and doesn't look like that I picked up along the way, often without noticing it. Yeah. One of them, you know, of course, is we don't, our personality doesn't count. We, we want to maybe erase our personality so that we can look a little bit like someone in science might look like Ramana Maharshi. Of course, none of us have ever met him, but the archetype is you're very still and unmoving. You spend your life on a day bed. Maybe you wave to people as they go by as if you were an exhibit at Disneyland, you know, the President Lincoln, uh, hello, he goes by. Or everything very slow. It, it's a little bit as if you are receiving 10 milligrams of Valium every 30 minutes. You know, you don't want to get too excited. That was all very difficult for me because I have a personality. I have certain interests. I have ways of expressing myself that were in conflict with what I had learned along my way of what I thought it looked like when you got to a certain state. I'm not... I can't say what state I'm in exactly, but, but I can tell you that I've given myself an awful lot of permission and freedom to express as full a range of aliveness as I can, whether or not it conforms to the ideas and the ideals that I picked up along the way about what it looks like. It actually now, you know what the highest expression of silence looks like? It looks like me. Now, hey. before everybody turns off, wait one minute, <laughs> let me explain. Don't be afraid, my darlings. If you get a mirror, if you get a mirror and you look into it, what you see in the mirror is also the most perfect expression of silence. If you are living in and from silence. It doesn't subdue oneself. It actually enlivens and arouses and animates all of the shock, all of the life force that is available throughout of existence. It doesn't mean we're going to end up as teachers in a certain way. That's you know part of part of that also is 
just because we learn from a teacher who's seated in a certain way in front of a room and they have big pictures of their gurus and women and men sit on either sides, whatever it might be, or a church or a temple, synagogue, doesn't matter. We all learn what it looks like, but at some point we have to erase all of that and declare that what is authentic in us, that what is deep and powerful and moving and alive in us is what silence looks like. Yes. The, uh, <clears throat> one, of, um, uh, one of the challenges I have when I teach silence is that, uh, especially at the very beginning, I can almost always get the student there very quickly, look into my eyes, do a few things, person's mind slows down, bang, she's there. I had a student, got there very quickly, we spent like a couple of hours in perfect silence. And uh, next time we met, no matter what I said about no expectation, she was expecting the same experience. <laughs> uh, so I realized that the most, one of the most important thing to teach is how to have no expectation, but that's another subject. So uh, there is this primal force of uh, now, <clears throat> uh, the now that is not a small piece stolen from time. It's it's an existential. Uh, it's an existential being of a person that where when we go deeper or higher than the duality and time. And that's that silent context, that force that exists right now as I speak that word that's alive and exists. The next moment is not going to be the same. To, to learn some sort of a behavior from our teachers. Whether, I mean, I had many teachers. Ramta was one, my main teacher. And uh, to imitate any of the teachers, whether it's Ramta, rough style, macho style, or more of an amaji, which is lovey, lovey, huggy, huggy style. <laughs> Which they are, they are both fine. But that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's on her website. Come and see. <laughs> huggy, huggy style. Lovey, lovey, luggy, huggy, huggy girl. It just reminds me of a commercial for Pampers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, so, we're going off. We're going off the rails now. We, 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 we're talking about. Uh, I'm trying to bring back the subject that we're talking about the fact <laughs> that, that silence looks Gabor, like sorry. So obviously, Nareet did not take her medications today. No, no, no. Uh, which, is, which is the good news for all of us. That's wonderful. There is, there is, there is a, she had one too, many, one too many espressos this morning. There's wonderful coffee houses and one too many espressos. Oh my goodness. Huggy, huggy, love you, love you, love you. I'm getting a t-shirt. I'm getting a t-shirt. I'm getting a t-shirt. It's probably it's probably a very good way to say it actually because it creates an it creates a it, it creates some kind of an impact because if I compare, apparently apparently if I compare uh, Ramta, my teacher, which was rough, uh, thirty-five thousand year old warrior. <laughs> sending us out to the cold and try to survive and do the fire breath and on and on and on so, to someone who just who lovingly hugs you and uh, uh, they are both teachers but what uh, the inner silence is the same how it looks on the surface is very very different and we it's 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 extremely important uh, essential uh, not to imitate the personality or the thought stream, but what's beyond it, what's behind it, the context within which, from where it sprung. That's it's right. very similar with any art form. We, yes, nice. 
we we have a picture which is oh my god what a beautiful picture and we uh, we are valuing that picture when in fact the real value is the silent space or the context which the painter used to create that picture mm -hmm. so yes uh, that's what uh, that that paragraph of yours remind me of silence does not look uh, the same mm -hmm. at any moment is different yeah. no, I I think, love sorry go ahead and read please i i think it's you know uh going to, from teacher to teacher and having so many teachers and and um so many spiritual values uh pre-awakening uh, it's actually creating such a trap because there's such an expectation that when you get it it's going to look a certain way it's going to feel a certain way. Uh, I'm going to behave in a certain way. All those different ways and what we call expectations right. are a huge barrier. Yeah. Because none of them are real. They're all mind made. And when you expect it to be a certain way, then you're locked into, you're actually locked in a mental, um, yeah expectation and it's very hard to penetrate through that well a lot of it has to do with the way in which teachings are transmitted yes our teachers our religious teachers our spiritual teachers and so on often we only know them when they're in quote working when we're in a satsang room or a retreat center or a zendo or wherever we don't know, we don't really see behind the curtain as in The Wizard of Oz. We, we yeah. sort of see the show, but we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. We don't know how they live. So when we find out, of course, there's a big scandal and everyone's disappointed or disillusioned. The word disillusion usually has a negative context, but I love that word. I love every time I have been disillusioned about a teaching or a teacher or something that I've uh, held to be true because it means I no longer have that illusion. So it's yeah. wonderful. You know, one of the things we, we might pick up, not in, in some paths because they're, they celebrate the body and sexuality and so on, but in other traditions, there's a little bit of a negative view of the body. It, it's sort of necessary evil. I think I picked that up a little bit along the way, but then I discovered, well, that's not that true for me. I, I may not be the body in any ultimate sense, which is fine, but, you know, as a double Taurus, wh whose idea of heaven is lying in a meadow and having my stomach rubbed. I say stomach for the sake of our interview. <laughs> <laughs> and the corned beef sandwich. Huh? <laughs> and being fed something, you know. Don't forget the food. Sleeping, eating, and sex is sort of my idea of heaven. But along the way, I had to, to realize that part of my expression of silent living was to allow all the various natural uh, impulses perhaps maybe that's not the best word but where was there some authenticity in my experience of the body which is this is a vehicle of tremendous joy and pleasure whereas pleasure was one of the themes that I picked up along the way is not being nearly as good as ecstasy, the tr transcendental ecstasy. The pleasure is transient and passing and it, you know. So I'm, I'm just saying that I, I, I've had to discover that how, what silence looks like. How does the embodiment of living beyond the thought stream look like? I had to finally be willing, even at the peril of being wrong and risking eternal damnation, which 
may not be such a bad thing, all things considered, but that it looked like me. That it looked like someone who, it turns out, really has quite a big interest in sex, se sexuality in, in all of its form. I've seen so many people cripple their, their inner artist, their creativity, yeah. because along the way they picked up somewhere it doesn't look like that. If Van Gogh, if Picasso, if Modigliani had picked up, well, painting doesn't look like how I paint, the world would have been worse off. So I think this soundbite for me means there's only one person who can be in the world as an ambassador of silence like you, and that's you. So knock, so knock yourself out. That's right. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful um, conversation or that uh, soundbite. And um, to be continued. So, so language for me now has meaning, it has application based on, of course, definitions and so on, but it doesn't have significance in and of itself. In the thought stream, it does. If I'm in the thought stream and someone says absolute reality or awakening, Gabor, what you were talking about before mystery or self-realization in the thought stream in in language as being real in and of itself it has significance when you move to the primal consciousness the primal awareness that existed for four plus billion years before language came about, you couldn't even say anything about significance because there was no thought stream. There was no thought stream. There was only the, the biological functioning of the animals at the time who did use certain languages. They used sounds to communicate things from the very beginning. And in some cases, the more we study about animals, the more we know, wow, in some cases, they've got very evolved forms of communication. Whales whose songs go through the entire ocean, for example, but they don't conceptualize the best we can know. They can experience emotion and so on, but they don't conceptualize the way we do with the advent of languages as, as we use it. So what was, where was the significance in the world for billions of years before humans showed up to say this is significant and this isn't? Right. It's only in the snow globe of language. Yes. If we re right, return or reconnect with what we call silence, simply not being in the thought stream, then how does language have significance? It, it, in that it, it has meaning, you know, it has meaning. That's how we negotiate life. But in terms of the existential questions that are behind most seeking and spiritual paths and religions, right, trying to, to resolve, answer and resolve the questions of how do we live. Yeah. It, as you said, I think, in one of our earlier chats, Kapoor, well, it hasn't really worked that well, has it? No. And my simple analysis is because all of the significance of 
scripture, the significance of Rumi, the significance, the significance of the Shiva Sutras, the Torah, whatever you'd like, is actually not significant at all in silence. It is only significant in the thought stream, but living in the thought stream never allows you to engage with the world before language, which is the ultimate solution to all existential issues. Right. So it, you know, it comes back to the thought stream or silence. They're, as Norit yeah. said, yeah. they're two species. They're two distinct, almost evolutionary species. Yeah. You know, that, and they're vast. So living in silence in the thought stream as a concept or a practice has nothing whatsoever to do with the dissolution of language, the collapse of language as a component of living in silence, where significance is derived in a different manner altogether. Right. Absolute reality has no significance whatsoever in silence. Right, exactly. I, I, I like that. Uh, uh, because what gives something significant is a, some sort of a comparison to something else. This is significant in comparison to this other thing. Because if this other thing didn't exist, this wouldn't be significant. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> You're fucking with my head now. <laughs> listen, you, you said, language. listen, you said, you, you said you did go to high school, so. <laughs> <laughs> We're just checking. Uh, I mean, there is a, um, if I'm saying something from the present moment or the, in the in-body present, I'm saying a word which has meaning but it's not in comparison to anything. It has no relationship to anything. It's a word which may have a meaning to this other person. If I'm in the thought stream, I keep comparing and comparing and comparing, and then I have narratives of thought streams that I'm comparing to other narratives of thought streams. And then you can meet people who are have many many PhDs who write papers on different subjects and they have thought streams upon thought streams so much so that there is not even a small gap in between the words there is no room for God to come in whatsoever because the guy is so fucking educated that educated himself or herself way out of uh, of, of the real real reality and unfortunately, many times, those are the people who are respected, who can relate thought streams to thought streams, when in fact, uh, what I would call them is like they are derivatives. Mm. They are not, there is no original thought. There is derivatives of thought upon derivatives upon derivatives. So the more derivatives, the further we, further we go away from the original thought or from God or from whatever original power and so uh, i i like the way you express it when you said significant uh a word spoken from let's say present felt inside my whole body spoken with absolute no reference point it's a declaration it's got the power and it's got it's as significant as something else that i said from presence unless of course i want to put emphasis on some sort of a in comparison which which very quickly of course has to go back to the original because we don't want to have derivatives upon derivatives upon derivatives uh, and, and i think that this kind of simplicity is where us as humans have to get back to to be able to speak as speak like 
declarations from not from comparison from being and when i speak from being to a person i may use a word that's specifically okay for this specific person but the love the context the non -com the non comparison is there always i could say to somebody uh, in the context of love, I could say any word, including like screw you or something like that. The content is not nearly as powerful as the context within which it is said. So um, that was all my thoughts from your word called significance. Thank you. The significance, one, just one last thing, the significance of words spoken from silence or in presence is that it evokes silence and presence like exactly. your book does exactly thank you H have you heard the expression we're not human beings having a spiritual experience we're spiritual beings having a human experience mm -hmm. no. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm so tired of being human. <laughs> right. You know, I, I think it was new. See, I, I think what happens is that some people sit around stoned or something. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm not making fun of that. I'm from, the, from this conversation in terms of significance, that has significance if you live in language. Yeah. Right. It's comparisons, it's distinctions, it gives you a point to identify with, it gives you <clears throat> a, a knowledge base from where you can be right, safe, and secure. But when you move to silence and language collapses, you, you, you are in the world, you are on the earth before humans existed. Yeah, that's right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. This has been an addendum to our previous episode. <laughs> Unbeknownst to these uh, wonderful uh, silent speakers, uh, I turned the recording button on. So uh, this is a continuation from the previous episode. And for now, that's it. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. I hope you laughed with us. And until next time. Good night or good morning, wherever you are, and God bless.